So again, to recap, in 1915, the war started in 1914, and by uh, 1915, um, again, Italy has joined the, uh, the Entente powers. You don't need to know about Bulgaria, but Bulgaria also joins the Central Powers. Both sides are recruiting and arming. One thing I want to mention about 1915 is that as you ran out of men in 1914, men and material in 1914, um, expedients were turned to. And one of the expedients that they turned to was the idea of using poison gas, trying to just kill the enemy with chemicals. Um, the first time they use this, actually both sides used it about the same time. There's not really a bad guy that you can point to in this. Both sides used it freely. Uh, the first gas they used was chlorine gas. This is a, an irritant. And um, they would just release it into the wind. They would have canisters of this stuff and just try to blow it on the other side's uh, troops. And then uh, later on, they figured out a gas that they could put inside of a canister and shoot it over. So they could actually shoot it to the other side and the canisters would explode and this gas would leak out and actually a heavy gas. So it would actually seep down into the earth. So as we're digging trenches, this gas would be seeping down in the earth. In fact, you could find yourself uh, just walking and falling into a hole and just absorbing this gas that just sits there. It's phosgene gas or mustard gas, they called it. Um, here's a sign warning you not to breathe this stuff in as if you need some kind of a warning. Uh, so everyone would be carrying around these gas masks. It just makes war, the hell of a war, even more hellish. Something else to talk about in 1915 is the British blockade. The British came out in 1914 expecting to meet the Kaiser's great navy, his prized possessions, and instead the Kaiser doesn't send them out. He does not send his great battleships out to fight the British battleships, and probably good. Uh, later on, he will send them out one time in 1916, but uh, initially, 1914, 1915, they don't come out, and so the British will just blockade Germany. Germany's really easy to blockade. You just put all the Royal Navy up in the North Sea, it's not too much to do up there, and so um, Germany will, will be blockaded. Um, they also, one thing to mention about the British is that they stop neutral ships. Neutral ships like to try to trade during wartime. I just mentioned Americans trying to make money off this. Well, we would love to trade with Germany. We're trading with France and Britain. We'd love to trade with Germany and make some money there. And instead, the British have this blockade, and they stop neutral ships. Now, what they're looking for here, because you're not supposed to stop a neutral ship, is that anything that the British consider contraband. And, of course, they make the definition of this word contraband up. And what they will say it is, is that anything that could possibly be used by the Germans to uh, make war on Britain, which is anything. Anything you could think of in the world can be used for war, pretty much, if you melt it down or use it in a different way. Food, medicine, anything like that, even. And so the British will just capture these ships and... You can go to a court in Britain and try to get your ship back, but uh, it's better just to stay away from Germany. Don't try to run the, Ger the British blockade. So it's not hard to blockade Germany. Just put your ships in the North Sea between Denmark and uh, Britain, and it pretty much blockades Germany. The German response to this is not to send out the battleships and possibly have the Navy completely destroyed. It's best to have the threat remain. The Germans will turn to a secret weapon. Hasn't been used before. Well... There was one in the American Revolution, there was one in the Civil War that we had tinkered with, but they've reached the point now where they actually this machine functions okay. The German submarine, also called the Unterseeboot, or just the U-boats, and they're really small in World War I. They're not huge craft. They can only, only stand under water for maybe 30 minutes at the most, enough time to go underneath, get away from the British Navy, you know, try to not be seen, and uh, they'll run the British blockade, get out of Germany, and then uh, go over to the, Ger the, the British coast and blockade Britain. That's kind of a tit for tat. If you're going to blockade Germany, then Germany will blockade Britain, right? Except this new weapon, which hasn't been used before, it's a very delicate weapon, and it can't really just announce itself. The rules of the sea are that you're supposed to fly a flag, and you're supposed to see the other side's flag and announce yourself. Well, a U-boat has to just pop up out of the water, shoot a torpedo, and run that it will be considered a terror weapon by the British. That's against all the laws, laws of the sea that the, Britain, the British have made. So uh, the Germans will turn to what they call unrestricted submarine warfare. They announce to the world, here's our announcement, that anybody coming near France or near Britain will be sunk. Neutrals included. And, of course, that's going to get our attention, America's attention as a neutral. But this is the way it has to be. A submarine pops up, sinks the ship, they can't pick up the survivors. They just can't fit them on the little boat. So you pop up, sink a ship, and run. And then in 1915, they sink a big ship. 
they're going to sink the RMS Lusitania. This is the sister ship of the Titanic. The Titanic had sunk just a couple of years earlier before the war. Well, this is the sister ship of the Titanic sailing in May of 1915 out of New York, headed for Britain or Ireland. And so um, this is a passenger liner. But the British, the, the Germans will say that there are munitions on board. There's war material on board. There's contraband on board. And so they announce as this ship leaves New York that they're going to sink it. And they do. They sink it off the coast of Ireland. Thousands of people die, including 124 Americans. Now that's the important issue here. Of course, the world is shocked that a passenger liner was sunk. But Americans are upset about 124 Americans died. And we almost go to war here. We almost declare war. Witten Wilson will talk us down. He'll contact the Germans. The Germans will apologize and rescind their unrestricted submarine warfare for a while. But uh, we almost went to war in 1915. Uh, the reason I mention it is because we are getting close to war. I also want to mention the propaganda. Propaganda means spin or uh, developing uh, your country's hatred toward the enemy people. And so the propaganda really turns against Germany. The Germans were not expecting this kind of propaganda war, and they lose World War I. Uh, Hitler in World War II will try to do better with the propaganda. But in World War I, the Germans just fall way behind the Allies in propaganda. It starts in Belgium, actually. The world, word will get out to the world that German soldiers were killing babies in Belgium and raping nuns, going into churches and raping nuns. None of that happened, but the point is the Germans were late to respond to it and say, no, that never happened. And the world is saying, yes, it must have happened. But it never actually never happened. And then they launched the submarines, which does not make them into the good guys here, that this is a new terror weapon. But the German response is, well, this is the only weapon we can go against the British with. And the world sees the Germans as the Huns. In fact, when you look at World War I, you read about World War I, sometimes they'll refer to the Germans as the Huns. And this is, of course, Germans are not Huns. Uh, Hungarians really aren't even Huns. But uh, this is like the end of, the, the end of civilization, that uh, the Huns brought down the Roman Empire, or s sounded the end of the Roman Empire. And this is what the Huns, the Germans, are bringing into civilization. So you see pictures like this of German soldiers looking like terrorists or rapists. And then uh, this is one of my favorites here. I just want to mention that we do fight the Germans in World War I. And this is one of our campaign posters against them. Destroy the mad brute here. The Germans, looks like the Kaiser with his pointed helmet and his mustache. Destroy the mad brute like the Kaiser. Here he is with a woman doing terrible things to women. Uh, destroying culture. Here's a bloody club with the word culture on it. And in the background, you see England destroyed or Europe destroyed, and then he's coming to America. This is why you must enlist in the American army is to stop the Germans. As we go into 1916, the Germans do the most dastardly thing ever in World War I. They come up with a completely new strategy, and it is terrible. Attrition. They're going to try to wear down the French. This is the strategy of attrition. It is the worst thing in war ever, the idea of not just trying to defeat your enemy, but let's just attack them and attack them and attack them, and hopefully they'll give out before we do. This is a strategy of attrition to wear down the French army. Of course, you'll be wearing down the German army, too. Um, the strategy is that World War I is a defensive war. It seems to be better on the defensive, so how do we get the, Ger the French to attack us? Where can we get the French to attack us? And they come up with an idea. In February of 1916, they attack a... French fortress at Verdun. Now, Verdun is pretty much in the heart of France. It's actually not near Paris, but um, it's off the, off the beaten path. But the Germans choose this place. It's a very famous French fortress, and they choose that if we attack this place, which the French really aren't defending very well, we can just take it, and the French will have to attack. And it is a huge success. The French capture much of Verdun, and as expected, it is a damage to the French morale, and the French declare that they must recapture Verdun. Even though it has nothing to do with saving Paris or ending this war, they have to do it for national honor. The people of France are uh, lost faith because they've lost Verdun, and so the French will try to reclaim Verdun. Here's where it is. Here's the French, the Western Front. Here's Paris way over here, and Verdun is over here. So most of the attacks are coming toward Paris here, but Verdun's off the beaten path. It's on a salient. The French were actually going to give it up anyway, but once the Germans claim it, the French must reclaim it, or the, that's the way the French believe, falling for the German trap. The French find a hero here at Verdun, uh, Patin, a General Patin, and he will tell his army that they must hold at all costs. We cannot give up Verdun, and he's the one with the, the catchphrase, they shall not pass. So here's the Germans attacking at Verdun, and the French counterattacking at Verdun. 
And this becomes the most legendary battle of World War I. There are lots of battles in World War I, but of all the battles, this one symbolizes the insanity of this war. That the Germans have chosen a strategy of attrition and the French are falling for it, just throwing men into a meat grinder for pretty much no reason. The German attack goes off in February successfully and the French counterattack all the way through June. That's February, March, April, May, June. That's, that's five months of French counterattacks trying to recapture Verdun. And the casualties figures just mount up un incredibly in 1916. The French will lose trying to recapture Verdun 315,000 men and the Germans 281,000 men. And the Germans cannot be happier that this seems like a huge success. They've struck uh, the right winning chord here. Look at those. That's uh, 30,000 less. And according to the German calculations, that should be a winner for um, Germany. It's just a terrible, terrible thing. The French do get help. French allies will come to the assistance as the French are being torn up at Verdun. The British will launch an attack at the Somme. This is up uh, around the Belgian-French border along the Somme River. This goes off in July. So as the French are winding down at Verdun, the French, the British decide to help them out and they'll be attacking from July till November. That's July, August, September, October, November. About five months of the British finally now, 1916, attacking the Germans. And uh, they go off and they lose 57,000 men on the first day, the British do, and yet they'll consider it a victory that they've actually driven the Germans back a little bit and so they will continue for five more months. By the time this thing's over in November, the British will have lost 40, 420,000 men to the German 437. So this shows you again the insanity of this war, but it took the pressure off Verdun. Look, the Germans have lost 17,000 more men than the Allies, and that was not part of the calculations for the Germans. So it's a huge success for the British. This will go down the history books as a huge success for the, for the British against the Germans. I also brought, want to bring this up because during these five months, you will see the first use of tanks. You see, World War I seems like an insane war, except there's a little bit of science going on. Somebody's trying to figure out a way to break through the enemy lines and then continue on. Well, the Maxim gun seems unstoppable in World War I, but here is a way, a machine that could carry the Maxim gun into the enemy lines, use it as an offensive weapon. They start off in September with these giant, massive armored tractors, basically, and then by 1917, they'll get better at it, and then by 1918, they'll have hundreds of these things rolling across the battlefield. Um, every country will experiment with tanks. It's not completely only the British idea, but the British have the material to do it. The Germans won't have the iron. No one else has the iron and the gasoline and the expendable equipment and troops that the British do. So the British will really get on this tank thing. I also want to mention the Russians here. The Russians in 1916 are still in the game and they try a attempt to help the French out. They will launch an offensive the, led by getting Brusilov to uh, attack the Austro-Hungarians. And it went off successfully uh, for the first few days, and then the Russians get slaughtered as this, as this thing peters out. Again, the Russians generally get slaughtered, and this is in 1916. So here's some pictures of some tanks here. Uh, the idea of a tank is to carry these Maxim guns forward and to break through enemy trenches. Here's one in the early years, 1916, is when the first use of a tank. And then they'll get a little more streamlined. This is about 1970 here, 1917. And uh, one of the problems you can see is the overground, trying to get across this ground. And then you get near trenches, and these things tend to fall into trenches. So they got a lot of problems to solve. These initial tanks are rolling along at one mile an hour in 1916, and by 1917, maybe three or four miles an hour. So there's a vast improvement. It's just a really slow improvement. <laughs>